morning, boys and girls. question for you this morning. What is the difference between wanting to do something and having to do something? Okay, so having to do something is being made to do something without any choice, like having to clean your room. Okay. <coughs> Right, you want to, you don't really have to. That's right. Yes. Who's going bye-bye? All those people? <laughs> Can we sit down? Want to play? Later. But today, we're going to do this. Thanks. All right. Well, when your mom or dad tells you that you have to eat your vegetables, um... Do you sometimes feel that that's difficult to do? No. No? Not for some, yeah. How many of you like vegetables? How about broccoli? Do you like bro broccoli? How about Brussels sprouts? Ooh, a couple. Oh, only one Brussels sprout. Okay, so what if you have to eat your Brussels sprouts? Would that be easy to do? Give it to the dog? <laughs> yeah. What... What about if mom or dad said that you have to eat a piece of pie or you have to eat some cake or candy? Yeah, would that be okay if they made you? Yeah. Sure. Okay. What about the things that we do for Jesus? Is that that we want to do them for Jesus or do we feel that we have to do them for Jesus? Maybe some of both there, huh? Sometimes we feel that we have to or sometimes we feel we want to. I hope that, that we'd want to do some things for Jesus because of being motivated by the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he's taking good care of us by forgiving us of all our sins. It, it reminds me of a story. There, there was once a young man who just got his driver's license. Do any of you have your driver's license? Not quite yet? Okay. Yeah. You'd like to, I know. When the, He just turned 16, got his driver's license, and he took Dad's car out for a drive, and he got in an accident. And it was a bad accident where the wrecker had to be called to tow the vehicle away. The police were called. And guess who else got a phone call? Yeah, his dad got a phone call, too. Okay. But you know, this dad showed his son his love because when he got to the scene of the accident, he first went to the son and said, are you okay? He asked about his son. He didn't ask about the car. And that showed his son that he loved him and cared for him. Okay? Let's sit down, please. Okay? Grandma? Do you want me to do anything differently? I thought I'd better ask to make sure I'm okay with this. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay if I have my grandson sit down? Good. All right. Jesus also shows that he cares for us and that he loves us. Okay. He shows that he cares for us and loves us. How did he do that? He died on the cross for us. That's right. Okay? And when he asks us to do stuff, that we get to share our love that he has already given us. We love because he first loved us. So when he asks us to do stuff, we show him our love by giving back some of his love that he's given to us. That's what I'd like you to know today, that sometimes it's a have to, sometimes it's a want to, but that we want to love Jesus by loving others. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, please forgive me when I don't want to help others. Help me to be thankful when I want to serve you. In your name I pray, amen. God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, amen. The text for this morning's sermon as we continue with our Empowered by Grace to Tie theme 
It comes from Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 through 22. We read as follows. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. This is the word of the Lord. A minister was walking along the beach one day, and he found a lamp. Picking it up and wiping it off caused the lamp to shake and smoke, and a genie came out. The genie thanked the minister for his newfound freedom after years of captivity and offered him one wish. The minister immediately said, I've always wanted to visit the Holy Land, but I'm afraid of flying, and I get seasick just thinking about boats. So could you build a highway across the ocean so that I could drive to the Holy Land? The genie looked at him in surprise, and he replied, you must be kidding. Do you realize the engineering challenges that would have to be overcome to achieve that feat? Even I have limitations. Can't you think of anything else that you would want to wish for? And so the minister thought for a few moments. And he said, okay, I know what I want. I wish for all the members of my church to become tithers. To that, the genie replied, do you want that to be a two-lane or a four-lane highway? <laughs> a couple invited some of their close friends to go with them to a popular restaurant. Both the food and the service was grand. When they were finished uh, uh, their, with their meal and their conversation, the host took care of the bill and made sure that uh, the tip was, was taken care of as well. As they left, the waiter gave them a warm and friendly smile and a, a, a wave goodbye, implying that their tip was, was good and generous. This scene is played out in restaurants all around the world on a daily basis. The standard tip seems to have, have escalated, though. It, it used to be 10%. Today, 20 Yeah. As the couple who paid for the dinner was filling out their offering envelopes the next morning for going to church, it dawned on them that they paid the waiter for an hour or two of service four times what they were giving God in their weekly offering. They gave the waiter the tithe and more, but to God they gave leftovers. There lies the irony that we make such a limited and poor response to God for all his goodness, his mercy, his grace, his love throughout our lifetimes and beyond even into eternity. That perhaps is why a wise person once said, surely there is something wrong with our standard of values when we compare what we spend for incidentals and amusement and compare that with what we return to the almighty God. A tip or a tithe? For Jacob, there was no hesitation about what his response to God, uh, God's abiding presence would be. For us, it seems to have become a more difficult decision. Jacob's story, you remember, is not about a saint so holy that he is awakened to find himself in the presence of God because of his good action. You remember Jacob had done? You remember where he had come from? It's the story of a scoundrel who awakes with a startling sense of wonder as he realizes that God had visited him in his dreams the night before in spite of all the mistakes that he had made. Jacob was in a bit of a jam. Well, because of the choices that he had made. He was selfish, calculating, and dishonest. His conniving had caught up with him. He deceived his aged age dad 
blind, got the blessing from him that was supposed to go to whom? His brother Esau. So he not only deceived his father, but cheated his brother and was running for his life to escape the consequences. It's on the first night of his flight, as he's now into the wilderness, that he finds himself pursued not by Esau, but by the grace of God. He had a vision of a ladder to heaven with angels ascending and descending. The Lord stood beside him and said, Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. In amazement, Jacob murmurs, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Wow. You think that was a little surprise to him? Jacob's situation is symbolic of the human condition as well. And it's threefold. One, a wrong relationship with things in the world. Two, a wrong relationship with people through deceit and dishonest dealings. And three, a wrong relationship with God by not acknowledging his presence and through our disobedience to him. Yet because of his vision, Jacob begins to see all he is and all he has belongs to God. They're gifts from him. He promises to use the stone, which he used as a pillow for his head, as a foundation for a pillar in the building of God's house. He says then, and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Here is, the, is, is one of the biblical affirmations for what is taught as the tithe. Now, we usually think of the tithe as a form of, of legalism, that eh, that's no longer part of our lives because we live in the, the New Testament, the new covenant with God. The general assumption is that, at least in many parts of the church today, is that the tithe is an expression of an archaic demand, not the grace-filled redemption of the redeemed in Jesus. Instead of threatening ultimatum upon a fearful people or a requirement for impoverished nomads, the tithe was a plan for salvation and security for this fragile nation. It set Israel apart. And it set it apart from the barbarous and callous fragile cultures that sought to engulf and destroy them in the land of promise. It was a gift from rather than an extraction of gifts. Douglas Johnson, in his insightful work, The Tithe, Challenge, or Legalism, insists this, and I quote, that the tithe of the Old Testament is a testimony to the interconnectedness of people and God. It incorporates a cycle of giving and receiving and using. It signifies a relationship that can't be content with using a strict formula from a past. The tithe, like the message of the Old Testament, is a living witness of God. End quote. Tithing, therefore, is not driven by legalistic compulsion, but rather arises at the spiritual response of a thankful soul. Do you tithe? Hearing about it hits home. We're like the farmer who was asked if, if he had 200 cows, would he give 20 to the church? Well, of course, he said. If you had 100 cows, would you give 10 to God? Well, of course, he replied. I most certainly would. If you had 10 cows, would you give one to God? Now, that's not fair, he said. You know I only have 10 cows. How many cows do you have? None. But what do you have? And are you willing to give it to God? One tenth. Our faith does not deny that economics is a place in the human condition. By the same token, it was Martin Luther who said that a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth what? Nothing. Tithing places before us a standard by which we may center our lives in gratitude to God. Tithing doesn't 
have anything to do with raising a budget or supporting a new building. It has everything to do with making a spiritual response to God. Jacob's story is timeless and relevant because it describes how this impoverished soul chose to respond. Tithing is not a barter with God. It's not a financial contract assuring an increase in profits if one participates. It's not a mathematical formula for assuring the presence of God in your life or a clever device for lining the coffers of the church. The tithe is essentially and fundamentally a testimony of faith in the creativity and goodness of God. What we do with what we have can be an outward and visible sign of God's inward and redeeming grace alive and well within us. Really? For me? I don't know. Do you realize that statistically, studies actually verify that the more money we make, the smaller percentage that we give? The biggest percentage givers to our church are those who have the smallest incomes statistically. I don't know specifically for our church that because I don't know the giving of anyone other than Diana and myself. But statistically, that's true for the church and therein it's probably true even for this church. The biggest percentages given are not the big salaried people with fine jobs as one might guess, but the average member and in some cases... Retired people and others who are on limited incomes are the ones giving the largest percentages. Now, maybe you can resonate with the following. A man who had pledged years ago to tithe all that he made to the work of the Lord. His first week's paycheck was $50, and so he tithed and gave how much that week in church? $5. As he grew older and more prosperous, he got $100 that week and now was giving $10. And then $200 a week. And then $500 a week. And then $5,000 a week that he was earning, therein tithing $500 a week. And all during that time, he continued to tithe. But then when he got to that, that $500 a week, he called his pastor and said, I've got to talk to you. And so the pastor went to his house, and they had a good time talking about the old times, and finally it came to the point. Do you remember that promise I made years ago, Pastor? How can I get released from it? It's like this, the man continued. When I made that promise... I had only to give $5 a week, but now I'm given $500 a week to fulfill that pledge and promise. Now the old pastor thought for a moment and then said to his friend, well, I'm afraid that we cannot get you released from that promise. But there is something we can do for you. We can kneel and ask God to shrink your income so that you can afford the tithe of $5 a week. <laughs> Funny, huh? Why? You know why? Because of the truth that lies behind it. Right behind every good joke is a bit of truth. Think about that. In your life, in the life of the church. How about you? Does your giving resemble a tip or a tithe? In the context of your own relationship to God, in Christ Jesus, your Lord, your Savior, you must decide. And this is my prediction. If you decide to accept the tithe as the standard, you will be beginning a grand Christian adventure in the faith. When the tithe is practiced, a desire for an even greater generosity fills you for God doesn't just have the tithe. He has the tither as well. 
God doesn't just have the tithe. He has the tither as well. And you will be amazed as to how happy you are with the other nine-tenths of your income. So as we use God's word as our guide, I find that this principle is valid as a starting point in, in my journey of faith. In giving a proportion, using the tenth as a guide, I can be spiritually comfortable knowing that I have not robbed God. And moreover, I have been emotionally comforted knowing that no matter how large the budget is or whatever expenses our church may have or the ministries may call for, my share of the burden is simply God's share of my income. Finally, I've been physically comfortable knowing from experience that our household does quite well on nine-tenths of our income. God blessing that nine-tenths gets us way farther than if we had it all without God's blessing. Our giving expresses gratitude. Our thanks to God for what he has done for us in Christ Jesus. You know what he's done for you. You know your sins forgiven in Christ Jesus. He calls you to repentance and is there at the foot of the cross to receive your sins, to forgive you, to cleanse you, to wash you completely clean. Praise God with that. Thanks be to God for that. How blessed we are to have a God who loves us this much. In spite of all our blessings, there are times when we give less than we should, and God still loves us and forgives us again. He is patient with us, and he keeps moving us along our journeys as God's stewards. Thanks be to God for that. Praise him with 100% of what he has entrusted to you. May the Lord's blessings be with you as you steward the many blessings that God has entrusted to your care. In Jesus' holy name, amen. And now may the peace of God which transcends all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting, amen.